So in this second lecture on the family, we're going to talk about meeting, mating, and multiplying. That is, how do people meet? Um, what do sexual unions look like? And what does the raising of children look like? And um, this uh, uh, is, you know, in the previous lecture, I talked about the sort of nostalgia trap of the traditional uh, family. Uh, this is the subject of an enormous amount of anxiety as well. Um, in other lectures, we discussed the concept of a moral panic or this extreme concern of the loss of norms of, uh, how, of how we organize our society. And the ways in, that people meet and mate um, today um, is the source of a huge amount of anxiety. So uh, what it is that apps are doing to people's capacity to meet one another and to their sexual practices is the subject of an enormous amount of sort of hand wringing and concern among social commentators. But, you know, uh, I'm going to point out a few things that should make you not so concerned about this, or at least, um, again, as I said in the last lecture, that um, when thinking about the contemporary family, that we should do so in light of data, um, and that one of the importance uh, important aspects of being a social scientist is having a theory about how things are working, but critically evaluating that theory in light of information so that you constantly question you know, your theory and you evaluate it relative to the best information possible. And as much as, as so some social commentators are deeply concerned about hookup culture and apps, I want to point out a few things from the very start. The first is that um, among young people today, rates of sexual activity are probably less than among their parents. So it seems like, um, uh, it, that given the best data that we have, that the age at first sex, that is the age at where, which um, people first have uh, experience, some sexual activity, is no younger than it was for um, their current children's parents' generation, it may be a little bit older, and that the total number of sexual partners seems to be declining, so that young people today typically have fewer sexual partners than their parents, and that the amount of sex that people are having is declining. And, you know, this doesn't mean that apps and other new contemporary ways of, uh, of like technologically mediated ways of finding partners is um, necessarily like not leading to sex. It just means that overall, we're not seeing this huge boom of sexual activity or people entering into the world having you know, really high rates of sexual activity. And so I'd like us today to sort of be a little bit more clear headed about what it is that people are doing when partnering in the 21st century, what configurations of partnerships are common and why, and how things outside of, the, uh, of what we sometimes think of as the family. So how capitalism, market economy, and forms of consumption affect our cultural traditions of meeting, mating, and multiplying, and under what conditions people are and are not having children. So, you know, the um, technology and dating, um, Durkheim, who we've heard a lot about throughout this course, theorized that complex societies can reduce social interaction. Um, and so, you know, this is the uh, idea, again, returning to the idea of a division of labor, that with the division of labor, um, uh, uh, people are less integrated potentially less integrated into broader social groups. And so, you know, that um, uh, uh, one of the ways in which, one of the consequences of that reduced social um, integration could be that it's harder to find people to form unions with, be that a sexual union or a household. Um, the things that are making uh, society more complex the economy and the division of labor, as Durkheim wasn't like foreseeing the internet, he was thinking about the economy and the division of labor, um, uh, do lead to an increased social complexity. But 
it's not necessarily the case that those things are unsolvable. So Durkheim posited that, you know, this lack of social integration could be addressed by a range of things. And so Durkheim said, you know, in, in a contempt, in, a, in, in modern life, within a complex society, we're all going to be less integrated. And so we need to create secondary groups or associations wherein we can become more integrated. So Durkheim pointed in the economy, for example, to unions and how labor unions might be able to create increased social connection within subgroups. The scholar Dana Boyd has argued that dating apps can increase integration. And she has said that that you know, one of the things that dating apps can do is create connections to people within great, more complex societies. And um, uh, uh, one of the places that scholars have looked at this is particularly within the LGBTQ community. Um, and the LGBTQ community exists within what scholars sometimes refer to as a thin market. And a thin market for partners is one in which the cost of finding a, a potential partner presents a barrier to forming a relationship. I'll say that again. A thin market is one where the cost of finding a potential partner presents a barrier to forming um, a relationship. And gay, lesbian, um, uh, bisexual, trans, queer, asexual people almost always exist in thin markets. So what does that mean? Well, it means that they're, if they live in a small town, for example, there aren't a lot of people, and it's fairly difficult to identify the people who are available to you. It's not manifestly clear who is within the LGBTQ community. And so within that community, within having that kind of thin dating market, dating apps and apps to form sexual unions are especially helpful. They can create the capacity for increased integration among groups. Um, but this isn't just the case for LGBTQ people. Um, in some of my own research, for example, one of the things that I found in work that I've published with Jennifer Hirsch is that people, young know, people often use dating apps in order to figure out like, who are the set of available people to them within their community? Who are the people who are open to relationships? Who are the people who are interested in the sets of things that they're interested in? This can create community and social integration. And this form of gathering information about people, gathering information about who is available, who is interested in what, who is a potential partner for you, is actually a very long, an old tradition of mating and partnering. Um, there have long been um, different kinds of social institutions that facilitate the process of people partnering. And technology is just simply the newest wave of this within that long old tradition. And the evidence doesn't seem to be that it creates a series of social problems. It may create some, but um, it's important to recognize that it can solve others. Uh, and so my um, personal perspective on this, and I would say that's somewhat informed by uh, the data on this, I'm not a total expert in this area, um, is that you know, there are benefits and um, some negative outcomes of these things, but just as there are with all others. Now the other concern um, with contemporary um, matching between people is uh, the uh, concerns over hooking up. Um, a hookup refers to a sexual encounter where there's no long-standing commitment, or at least there's no presumption of any long-standing commitment. And um, hookup culture is also something that's been kind of a source of uh, e extreme social anxiety. Um, and when thinking about hookup culture, Sometimes it's tied to apps, but sometimes it's not. It's just the idea that people are forming sexual unions that have no long-term future uh, assumed within them. Uh, but uh, Kathleen Bogle's Hooking Up, Sex, Dating, and Relationships on Campus 
argues that two factors have led to the increase in sexual, casual sexual encounters, the delay of marriage and the increasing number of people in college. So these are two critical things. Um, the first is the delay in marriage. And um, you know, the, if we look at young people's experiences today with uh, hooking up and sex, one of the reasons there are hooking up and relationships, excuse me, one of the reasons that quote unquote hookups are, are rather common is that the distance between the age at which people first have sex and the age at which they enter into um, a uh, more permanent union, such as marriage, is about a decade. So the distance between the time at which people first have sex and the time at which they enter into, presumably, not always, a kind of um, uh, um, uh, exclusive partnership with somebody else, primarily marriage, is a decade. That is a long period of time. So within that time frame, people have what we might identify as a lot of casual relationships. Now, I'll remind you that they don't have that many casual sexual relationships, that in fact, the number of people that young people are having sex with today is no greater than it was for their parents' generation. But the delay of marriage has led to, or is associated with at least, an increase in hooking up. The second important factor is the number of people who are in college and universities. And colleges and universities create an opportunity structure. That is, they create an opportunity for finding someone to form a sexual union with. And one of the greatest challenges to forming a union is opportunity. Like, you know, um, some of you have probably asked yourself or asked your peers, when or how could I possibly meet somebody? And what you're asking about is like, where are my opportunities for partners? Where are the contexts within which this might happen? And college and university sort of solves a huge amount of the opportunity problem. Why? Because instead of distributing you know, 18 to 25 year olds all throughout society, you actually collect them all into one place. And by collecting them all into one place, people have the recognition that like, well, actually, um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a pool of people here who I might form a union with. Now, there are um, nonetheless concerns that we might have about hookups. Um, and uh, so, you know, one of the concerns about hookups is gender inequality. And this is sometimes referred to as the orgasm gap. Um, and recent research showed that hookups are far less likely to end in orgasms for women in their sexual, in their, in their, uh, sexual relationships, um, in part because both partners are more dismissive of women's entitlement to pleasure in hookups. But within relationships, that's less likely to be the case, that women's pleasure is important within relationships. And this is sometimes referred to as the orgasm gap, or the fact that men um, uh, um, frequently experience orgasms within hookups and women do not. Now, one of the reasons we might be concerned about that is that it's a symbol or a signifier of inequality. And, you know, you may think like, is this really a form, Seamus, of inequality that you should care about? And I will say absolutely it is a form of inequality that we should care about in part because what it signals is that there's a, not as full a recognition of women's rights and desires as having an obligation to satisfy those. Um, so that, I'll put that a little bit clearer, it reflects basically that women don't have the same uh, set of expectations to realize their wants and desires as men do, that they don't have the same right to that. And that that in some ways invalidates women's humanity and we should challenge that. Um, um, and so this points to some of the values of relationships because relationships um, are a context within which women's pleasure, women's wants and desires um, are things that people are more deeply committed to. Now, this isn't to say that relationships are a panacea. Um, relationships are also contexts of extreme social control. Um, 
Uh, and this, because of gender in inequitable dynamics, can also lead to harms. Um, it can also lead to harms for men because of relationships of social control, although it's much more likely that it happens for women. Um, and in queer relationships, you have even you know, similar kinds of dynamics of the ways in which social control works within relationships. So relationships aren't a panacea. That is, they're not an, I, just this perfect form that we should try to realize. Nonetheless, it's important to recognize how transitory encounters may reveal some of the, the processes whereby gender inequalities are working, which is a complicated, not very eloquent way of saying that these kinds of hookups where women's pleasure aren't, is, where women's pleasure is less likely to be satisfied reveal something about the organization of a society where women's wants and desires are seen as something that aren't as important to be realized. You should also note that hooking up is in some ways kind of going out of style, um, that the fear is overblown and, you know, that traditional dating was never a, a picnic, but that um, the rates of hookups don't seem to be increasing uh, uh, at all. If anything, they seem to be decreasing. And research on younger people, including some of my own research on younger people, um, suggests that hookups are not the ideal relationship form for most young people. Um, uh, later in life, uh, so beyond the kind of late teens, early 20s, um, we've seen a transformation in um, uh, how it is that people are partnering. And part of this change is called the cohabiting revolution. So Smock and Manning um, uh, note that the most common form of romantic relationship is one where people live together. Cohabitation, simply living together, was a relatively rare occurrence 30 years ago, and now it's downright typical. So it was very rare 30 years ago for two unmarried people to live together, and now it's a fairly typical family form or household form. And Smock and Manning say that cohabiting couples are less likely to have college degrees. They're, they tend to have lower incomes. They tend to have unemployment levels almost twice as high as married couples. And one reason this might be, um, Smock and Manning argue, is that their respondents often said that they wanted their finances in place before they got married. But currently, over 12 million unmarried partners cohabit with one another in the United States. So that's um, uh, 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 a large number of people. And cohabitors are, again, shouldn't view this as like a middle, upper middle class phenomenon. It's people who are less likely to have gone to college, people with lower incomes, and people who have higher rates of unemployment. One way to think about this is cohabitation is a strategy to weather tenuous economic conditions. So, you know, in other social forms, in other historical time periods, the household as a constitution may have included lots of different kinds of people, um, older children who were unmarried at that time, parents, grandparents, younger children, maybe even you know, the children of some of the children. So you have this kind of complex form. And one of the reasons that might exist is because the many people within that unit provide some stability for moments where people have their lives disrupted by unemployment or some other thing. And those forms are a little less likely today. And so one of the ways that people ad like address um, economic uncertainty can be cohabitation. Uh, because cohabitation reduces costs, it does all kinds of things um, to help you basically weather a set of uh, difficult economic circumstances. But it isn't just that. It's also that people want to live with other people, um, that humans are, for the most part, pretty social animals. And that um, if you leave the household of your family, and living alone can be something challenging for uh, some people, and that cohabiting is something pleasant that people like. Um, 
Cohabitors, however, are more likely, if they eventually get married, to divorce. But it's not because they cohabited before. So um, there'll be some research you may hear that says people who cohabit before marriage are more likely to get divorced. And that is true. But it's not because they cohabit. Most of the effect is because they're poorer and poorer people are more likely to get divorced overall. There's also some effect of, of cohabitation, I should say. There's a little bit of an effect of the cohabitation. And part of it is that co people who cohabited before they got married are more okay with the idea of divorce. So divorce isn't seen as such a failure of their relationship. To them. In addition, uh, oh, excuse me. Um, um, uh, I should say that in addition to the cohabiting revolution, there's also been a massive rise of people living alone. And the rise of people living alone, this is a major demographic finding, um, is driven by a range of social forces. Um, and uh, this demographic finding was found by a series of demographers and then a qualitative scholar, Eric Kleinenberg, has interviewed a bunch of people who lived alone, refers to these people as singletons. And, you know, part of the reason that, and it's an interesting book um, um, uh, uh, about uh, the rise of living alone, um, why it is that people live alone. And some of the reasons are multiple. The first is that divorce means that people, the rise in divorce from the 1960s means that more people live alone. But also increasingly, um, uh, uh, living alone is driven by some gender dynamics. So in um, previous society, uh, previous historical moments, it was sort of less acceptable for women to live alone. But today, as women have entered the labor market at higher rates, they have the capacity to not live within two household structures, either their parents' household structure or the person they're married to's household structure. And that was a, a, the primary way in which women moved from household to household. That is, they lived with their parents until they got married and then they lived with their husband. And this, is a form of gendered social control. Women don't have the same kind of autonomy. But the rise of living alone is partially driven by the rise of women living alone. It's also driven by the rise of divorce and the rise of the acceptability of older women living alone. So women who get divorced at middle age can live alone, or women whose um, uh, husbands pass away, women live to older ages than men do, um, typically live alone. And this is a, another kind of big demographic change in household structure. You'll notice that sometimes I talk about marriage and the family, and sometimes I talk about households. One, ways to, one way to think about family is also to think about household. And so family are just the collection of people who live in a home together or who stay in the same home. Um, uh, it's not a totally satisfying definition, in part because people consider themselves family after they leave their houses um, and don't live together. Um, so it could be people who at one point in time lived in a household together, but even that is not always satisfying because some people, you know, I never lived in a household with my grandparents, but I thought of them as my family. Um, uh, but you know, I'll kind of use both of them throughout this discussion. Um, now, after people sort of find one another, one of the things that they do is get married. Um, and um, uh, uh, Vicki Howard has uh, described the marriage process as the wedding industrial complex um, and how there's a merging uh, of economic interest and industries with the rituals surrounding marriage. And so um, uh, what these scholars are pointing to, scholars like Vicki Howard, um, things that, like, there's a series of rituals that center around marriage. Um, uh, in the United States, one involves buying a ring. And so that buying of a ring has led to a series of industry actions um, where uh, uh, I think, I forget how much a ring is supposed to cost, but like the diamond industry has been like, you should spend three months salary on a ring. Um, now, that is not a tradition. That is simply the industry marketing to a particular tradition. And so marriage is a ritual process. It's a process of ritual, which means 
that there are sets of things that every society does to recognize a marriage. Um, uh, usually it means collecting together and going through some kind of pre-scripted thing. So um, in most societies, uh, many people could kind of almost uh, articulate what the script or the ritual script of a marriage is. Um, you know, the um, uh, ritual script in the United States would be, you know, dearly beloved, we're gathered here today to celebrate the union of. And that phrase is the beginning of a marriage ritual. And that marriage ritual includes vows to one another and the community having the opportunity to come together and support, potentially object to the union. A kiss to, uh, to sort of certify the sort of formally like create the connection of the union. Um, you know, the idea of a ring which has no beginning and no end, um, which signifies within the ritual a certain part of, uh, of, of what it means to be married, that there is no beginning to you and end to you. You instead are all one big circle together and that the relationship has no end. Um, uh, so there are all of these sort of uh, symbols that we mobilize through rituals in order to create a wedding. And um, this created an economic opportunity because many rituals are things that are super valuable to us. And insofar as they're valuable to us, they can become very valuable to industry. And Vicki Howard has argued that there's a constant string of events taking place that calls for merchandise that does not end until the last anniversary of the wedding is celebrated. So um, this means that you have to buy things all the time in order to celebrate one's wedding. You have to go get anniversary gifts. You have to have gifts maybe for the first time you went on a date together. You get gifts to celebrate all kinds of things. And then your family also participates in this. And um, you know, the, this has resulted in a dramatic growth in what we might call the wedding industry. And this helps us see how different social rituals, insofar as they are socially valuable, are often commodified by economic institutions to generate economic value. Um, and this ends up being a very, very fine line um, where if it becomes too economically commodified, it seems like a market exchange, which makes it feel not like a deeply held social commitment, but at the same time, if you don't satisfy some of the requirements of commodification, it's pretty, it can be very bad for your relationship. So if you uh, stand firmly against buying anniversary gifts for your partner, they may be pretty upset that you've chosen to do that. So the take home here is that the, the set of formalization of relationships that are valuable to us are things that industry can capitalize upon in order to generate even more rituals around that thing. So Hallmark, for example, and their cards Hallmark has a deep interest in the proliferation of days that you have to celebrate. This doesn't just apply to marriages, it applies to families more generally. So, you know, they'll invent things like Father's Day, they'll advance, you know, the importance of Valentine's Day. But all of this is an economic marketing push to signify the importance of purchasing things for others within our household or romantic relationships. And the tension is, is that that has to still have a symbolic value to it. It can't just feel like an economic exchange. In other words, if you gave your partner cash on Valentine's Day, <clears throat> this would not be seen as a positive thing at all. It would be kind of horrific. But often the things that are valuable to us in a social sense, are things that might be capitalized upon by industry in order to generate economic value. And these can be mutually reinforcing. Um, so if you think for a moment about Christian holidays, what, what 
what has happened in the United States around Christian holidays? Well, the most obvious is Christmas, which is all about consumption and gift giving and presents. And part of that is the story of Christmas facilitates that. The three wise men bring gifts to Christ's family. Um, um, and so you can capitalize upon that. But, you know, Easter, which is this moment of rebirth, you know, the chocolate industry has certainly capitalized on Easter in order to create economic opportunities for the sets of important social and religious moments. So we begin to see how households and the formation of unions are not just a set of social relationships of ties to one another, um, but instead are also part of a range of economic actions and marketing campaigns in order to reaffirm our commitment. Finally, um, I want us to think about fertility and reproduction. Families are smaller now than they were 40 years ago. And um, actually they continue to decline in size. And this will be something we talk more about in a series of demography lectures. The teen pregnancy rate is at a historic low. Um, so again, this refers to the sort of panic over this uh, family. It's not really borne out by the data. Teen pregnancy is not at all on the rise. And it's not that women aren't having children at all anymore. It's that they're having fewer children and having them later in life. So this is important to recognize that um, the decline in um, uh, family size is because people are having fewer children, which is really obvious. And part of the reason that they're having fewer children is that um, uh, couples uh, and women in particular, um, I mean, obviously couples have to be involved, but um, it doesn't have to be the kind of couple of a marriage. Women are delaying their fertility to later in life. Most women do eventually have children, but the share of women who, you know, who've never had children is, is in fact at its lowest point in nearly 20 years. Um, let me say that again, because I don't think it was very clear. The share of women who've never had children is at its lowest point in 20 years. So most women are having children and actually women, more women have children now than did 20 years ago. But women are having children later than ever in life. So from 1970 to 2006, the average age at first childbirth of American women went up from 21 years old to 25 years old. So in 1970, women on average were having children at the age of 21. And in 2006, uh, the age was 25, it's even a little higher now. And this having of children later is part of an explanation of why it is that there are fewer children. Families are now typically smaller than the previous generations. In 1976, 40% of mothers had four or more children, and now only 14%. And this reduction in fertility is driven by probably three factors. The first is that women have increased educational attainment and labor market participation. So as women have entered the labor market at higher rates, and have increased their overall educational attainment, they've delayed their fertility. Um, and you know, part of this is that women graduate from college, many of them, you know, um, or have some college, uh, and they want to establish a career before having children. Or women want to establish a career who haven't gone to college, they want to establish themselves as more economically independent before first having children. The second reason is improvements in contraceptive reliability. So um, critically, women's capacity to control their own fertility through contraception, which means things like the birth control pill or the broader availability of condoms or the availability of other forms of contraception, um, such as IUDs, et cetera, um, which is a device that is inserted into women um, that doesn't require the hormonal things that um, a birth control pill would. Um, these improvements in contraceptive reliability have meant that women have more control over their fertility. They can actually regulate with some effectiveness when they have children. It was much harder for women to do this in um, previous eras. And then the third is that the marriage rate is at an all-time low. 
So um, uh, 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 this points to a series of reasons why there's been a decline in fertility. In future lectures, um, in future lectures on demography, we'll talk about some of the advantages and disadvantages of this declining fertility rate. Um, so what are the consequences of declining fertility on a global and national scale? On a global scale, some of the things that we'll point to is environmental degradation and um, how it is that increasing human populations may be really part of the coming economic, I mean, not economic, environmental crisis. But then on a national scale, the decline in fertility does have some concerns because many of our social policies are predicated on demographic growth. Um, and what I mean by that is that many of our social policies like Social Security or Medicare or um, ways that we pay for elderly people and we pay for health care are predicated on the idea of growth. And as that growth declines, questions of how it is we'll pay for a set of social programs becomes much more acute. Those questions become much more acute. It's there I'll stop in the next lecture. We'll talk about institutional and interpersonal challenges to family formation.